watch from the sidelines. The parades of synthetics. The simulations. Little drummer boys are beating the human skins to death. Plastic smiles smeared across faces. God made man in his own image. But cloning and reprogramming DNA is the step backward. The demon race of androids and soulless creatures. Welcome to the future of lunatics, heretics, and sick pedophiles. No limits of fresh meat to satisfy their evil lusts. No limits to the abominations. Abominations. Huh. Follow like toy soldiers marching to the slaughter. No limits. The iPhones and the iPads blast. Transhuman rhetoric. Original thoughts blur, slur, because it's the spark being stolen. But the zombies have no clue. Kangaroo courts and compromised politicians are useless. And the parade continues. Goose stepping. Rodin's gates of hell are opening. The originals are being sacrificed. But only after their DNA has been sampled and stolen. Future soulless blandness awaits. Welcome to the new and proved. Huh. Blue screens and holographs program the weak. Bubble heads and Washington hair newscasters spin the stories. And the factories are closing, being replaced by reproductive modifying centers and slaughterhouses for the unwanted. My gift is emptying into the abyss. The hourglass is draining. In this parade, the charade is so lifeless. Rosemary's babies programmed to reject love. Toy soldier armies smile as they pass. And the mom and the little boy next to me, they wave their flags, red, white, and bruised. Awesome is the deception if it wasn't so. Oh, I don't know the word. Black hole. Ah, oh, this does make me laugh when I see the float of Mickey Mouse. When it stops mid salute, the black gloved hand points to me. And the security's on its way. There's a human in our midst! I hear Mickey scream. The crowd gathers around me. They're all furious, deleterious, eyes glazed over. Their only emotion, hate. But wait, sadly, the androids have no idea why. Welcome, everyone. I'm joined by my special guest today, Mr. Stephen Shellen, certified crazy man, right? <laughs> Don't we're say that. Then no one will believe my story. Because <laughs> no, we're in the crazy club together, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's all, it's all tongue-in-cheek, man. No, you have an absolutely incredible story. It is kind of kooky. You know, when I was young, I was kind of wild on Hollywood. I mean, I wasn't a thief and I wouldn't maliciously attack anyone like I told you or anything like that. But I was considered a bit of a, a wild guy. So people would say, oh, yeah, Sheldon, he's crazy. You know, well, you know, years later, being called crazy really came back to haunt me. Mm -hmm. Except being called crazy. I always thought it was kind of cool. If, you know, someone thinks I'm a bit nuts. Great. At least I'm interesting. Right. Yeah. But yeah, when you get called crazy, they mean mentally ill. Well, it's suddenly not any fun anymore. And then you're always on your back feet trying to like, you know, navigate uh, off balance. And, and I see this everywhere right now. I mean, not just with me, with, with the, just with everything. I mean, yeah. And they're, they're go the go-to uh, term that everybody will use is you're a conspiracy nut. It's like, wait a second. 
everything I was talking about 20 years ago has pretty much been proven to be true. So I don't get it. Why am I, why am I still considered a conspiracy nut if I'm not like, you know what I mean? I'm not like, I'm not saying things that are baseless or I don't believe things that are, that are baseless. I, I think a lot of people don't ask and all this stuff, man, oh man. And, and, and the masks are so symbolic for me. Like it's so much more than just a cover up. Like it's really this, which is so popular in Hollywood. Yeah. Muzzling yeah. us. Yep. And yeah. <laughs> but I didn't realize the general public and no disrespect to anyone that's listening, but I didn't realize the general public and, and Kim, who was never into conspiracies prior to, you know, being with me again. Um, and we've been together 17 years, but her and I both are just like, wow, why? Like, like, like everyone's so easily moved around. It literally is she, you know, and there's some evil dogs just moving them around and the, the zombie sheep. So the poem that I wrote that's in my film I, I was just writing it fast, you know, and I, I, I had no idea that I was just try, also trying to make a film. And when you make a film, you want to be somewhat interesting. You, you want your story to be compelling. So I didn't think that poem would become almost like like a, a precursor or, or prophetic in some in some weird way, because I was just writing it. God was just like giving me the words. I was writing it down. You know, it was just effortless. <laughs> But yeah, we can't believe how easily people are moved around and it's, yeah, it's very sad. So where do you want to start? Well, <laughs> speaking of that montage, you know, I, um, our buddy Mike Pack, the Hollywood defector, now he's the Hollywood reporter. He's changed his uh, name on, on Twitter. Um, Mike uh, reached out to me a couple of months ago. He's like, Chris, man. I know this guy, Stephen Shaw, and he, you know, he's this badass guy from Hollywood, man. He was like in Law and Order and The River Runs Through, which is a movie I remember seeing in the theater. Um, too. And, uh, and you sent me that clip this morning from, from Casual Sex uh -huh. and some other style. Like, uh, <laughs> you heard my joke, right? You ruined a 16-year-old boy's fantasy. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, ru I'll ruin a lot of other fantasies before this is out. I know, right? So, um, but yes, I, I mean, you're, 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 you're a Hollywood vet certified, right? Man, you had a really strong career, your filmography, your directing work, even your friends, you know? Uh, you were good friends with Bill Paxton, who passed away in 2017, and everybody knows who Bill Paxton is. And... Uh, because of what you went through, you, you had this whole, you, you know, you, you were living the high life, right? You were living the Hollywood life, you know, fame and, you know, knowing everybody, having significance and influence and connections and all that stuff. And then poof, tell us how that happened. And, tell, and, and also tell us that the film that I'm going to encourage uh, everyone on my channel to watch, um, I know you've got it on Vimeo for purchase and maybe we can figure out a way to give a discount code to my viewers so they can get a little bit off when they well log actually in. There, is, there is something there's a festival screening and for this show i'd be willing my objective right now uh -huh. is certainly not to get rich off renting my film i yep. i not for free periodically yep so what i'll do is i'll give your viewers the the free uh you know a festival screening copy which awesome. is a little bit lower res than the one that's out there for uh, rent or purchase, but it's still apparently people, you know, it, it's still good. Awesome. But, um, so I went, I was a hockey player. I met Eileen Ford in Vancouver when I was working road construction, you know, with black tar, you do the road thing. Yeah. And, uh, this biker guy would pick me, pick me up on his Harley, take me to work. Well, in the midst of this summer job, I, I got a, a modeling agent and I, and I started getting modeling work. So I'd be on the road crew with the biker guys and stuff. And then I'd slip off to a restaurant, go in the change room like, you know, Superman into the phone booth and come out with my white pleated pants, you know, my, my polka dot shirt and my, and my sweater tied around my shoulders. Kind of the look that I have when a river runs through it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And these guys didn't know what to make of it. Like, what do you, what do you mean you're a model? I like, I'm, I know it sounds stupid, but believe me, man, you meet so many beautiful women and, you know, it's that kind of thing. So yeah. then I went to London, England, then I went to New York. And I actually just liked doing really cool photos. I wasn't really in, I, I was too stupid to figure out that I should be doing catalogs and just concentrating on the money with Ford Models as my agent. So I sort of blew off the catalog stuff and I got bored with it by 22. And then I, um, I terrorized a couple of photographers. I thought it was fun, but I, maybe they didn't. And um, there's a whole lot to go into in that and the whole, the whole gayness of it and how they coerce or try you, uh, all these straight guys that are rowers for the Yale rowing team, you know? And yeah. Why can't gay guys just go after gay guys? Why don't they need to like go after straight guys? I don't know. That's a whole nother conversation. But I went up to LA. They and, call that they call that bareback conquering. Is that what it is? Wow. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Well, like, totally I good. can land a straight guy. I'm so good. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So then I'm out in LA and I start acting. I get an agent before anything. Actually a manager. Yeah. And then Within about six months, I've got William Morris. But I'm like, I've barely been to acting classes, man. Like, I was like way in over my head. And they wanted me to, you know, get a TV show and this kind of stuff. And I, um, I got fired from William Morris, which was the best thing that ever happened. Because then I went to this woman, Peggy Fury. Yeah. And I took acting classes. Sean Penn had gone there. Nick Cage was there. Michelle Pfeiffer. You know, loads of, of what became good actors. And then I got it. I got the bug, man. I, got, I said, wow, I love this. So uh, I also had a bar in Venice shortly after that. I had poetry and theater in my bar. Sean Penn did the police play in my bar. But as far as like me living the dream, I did buy a house under the Hollywood sign. But um, you know, my mother, when she'd come and visit, she's real kind of, she was a sick of kind of personality. She loved like, oh, look, Burt Reynolds, you know? And I was like, oh, mom, please, you know, don't, don't bug the guy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I, when I'd get invited to a lot of events and stuff, I had an off, and this is my, this is my Achilles heel. I, and Kim just walked in, she can verify. Hey, Kim! So uh, I would have a horrible habit of telling the truth. Yeah. So if I'm at a Hollywood party and there's like big shots there. Yeah. And back in the day, I knew Shane Black through a girl I dated. Uh, David Fincher, I knew uh, not well, of course, but uh, that's a long story. About and Shane Black did, uh, he did Iron Man 2 and he did the film Long Kiss Goodnight, which we'll, we'll talk about shortly, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to sort of speed through the, the, the short version, but it's tough. Um, so anyway, yeah, I knew those people, but I knew well enough, I knew myself well enough to say, um, you know what, I don't think I'm going to go to these, these, too many of these parties. Yeah. Um, because I'm going to say something, you know? And then well, on, on one afternoon, I went to a party that this girl that I briefly dated, that knew Shane and Fincher, I went to their party, but I had a guy staying with me who just got a nine year stretch in prison. And he was a hell's angel. And as an actor, a stupid actor, I thought, ooh, isn't this interesting? He's an angel. And, you know, maybe it'll, I can develop a character with him. You know, like, this will be so interesting. But I mean, you know, it, long story short, it, it, was, it was a dangerous kind of move to make. The guy's living with me, takes my truck, comes back three days later. I'm screaming at him, you know, come on, Helen, you know. But I took him with me to the afternoon party. And Ellen thought that Fincher's, girlfriend uh, stole his, his little like biker sunglasses. Someone's putting his steel toe boots on to go kick her in the head, which she would have done. Yeah. And I'm like, oh no, I, you know, I'm turning into Woody Allen. No, no, Allen, wait, wait, wait. And I find the glasses at the last second in the jacuzzi. And just as he's rounding the corner of the pool to go directly over to her, I'm screaming, I got the glasses, I got the glasses. But I think those kind of events with Shane Black and, and, and Fincher, they, they, I don't know if they knew what to make of me. And I wasn't into like street fighting constantly or any of that stuff. But I also, I think because I've been a successful model at 20 and 21 in London, England, and I met like Lord Litchfield and I met all these people, right? And celebrities and stuff and, that were filming in London or whatever. 
But I, I think that I, um, I don't want to say a bad taste in my mouth, but when you've lived around Europe and then you go out to LA and it's like, this is what they're all talking about. Like, this is the head of the film industry. Like, like it's just a bunch of shopping malls and a, a, like a cardboard looking sign, you know? Like, it, it, it's not the greatest looking city in the world. It's not, it's not creatively super, uh, you know, and, and compelling or anything. But um, yeah, so I, I didn't go to many parties, Hollywood parties after a while. And once I got my house, I didn't. And what happened is I got a TV show with Christopher Plummer. And uh, I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. I kept turning it down. And uh, this is after I'd done Casual Sex and this other movie called Murder One that Harvey Weinstein uh, produced, executive produced. So on one, I'm a flake, right? Good looking flake guy. And then this other one, I'm a, I'm, I was playing a real life guy who uh, got out of, escaped from prison and went out and murdered seven people at a farmhouse one afternoon. And I was like, I, was, I wasn't attractive inside or out in that film. But I thought it was nice that when those two films just closed, you know, next to each other within a six month span on this guy and then on this guy. So I was starting to get work, but not, not a lot. I wasn't on the, um, I wasn't ever, um, you know, what's the word endorsed. Right. Yeah. People would say like, you just did this, you did this stepfather. It's a classic horror film now. Like you're not getting any work. And I'm like, no, not, not really. It's all right. You know, it's all right. Uh, that was my, my attitude in Hollywood days. Ah, it's, yeah, it's all right. It's all right. So I, I wasn't working. I had this house I bought. I had a child I didn't know. I, I, I was in a child support case paying before a DNA test was done from a woman I briefly knew. And I needed money. So I ended up, um, I ended up um, you know, basically giving in and went up to Canada to do this series with Plummer. And then I, I wasn't happy. It was an awful, 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 you know, just awful. And writing's always been important to me. And when something's poorly written, it's like, you know, there's an old expression, polishing, S-H. Yeah. 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 So I did it. And uh, I probably pissed some people off. Generally speaking, I'd be hired by the same producers or directors, you know, more than once. But in this instance, uh, probably not. And I didn't like doing it. I didn't like this Summer McCorkindale, whose wife he's the day, um, uh, Prince Charles. So anyway, I, I did a year and I quit. But in the interim, I, I'd gone to Paris to film, which ain't so bad. I can't complain. Paris was pretty cool then. And I uh, met this young woman that worked at a reception of a hotel. I had a brief fling with her, came back to Canada, finished filming. She calls me up one day. I had, hello? She goes, I, I, I am coming to Canada. I'm like, who is this? Oh, it's Florence. And I'm like, Florence. Oh, Florence from the hotel. You worked at the hotel. Oh, yeah, okay. Why if you're coming? I said, well, I'm really busy right now. Like, you know, I just bought this farm. I got my house in LA and I got my two dogs. Like, when are you planning on coming? Tomorrow. And I'm like, oh, Okay, uh, uh, yeah, okay, what, what flight, you know, what time, blah, blah, blah. And I pick her up. Uh, she leaves about a month and a half later. She never visits the rest of Canada. I know nothing about her, her family. She has no friends when she comes to me. Very little personality, sorry, you know. Uh, I'm not misogynist for saying that. She didn't have much of a personality. Um, and uh, a month later, she left, and then um, I find out, Another phone call. I'm now in LA for Christmas, and my I, phone rings. I answer. I'm my father's giving that's five thousand dollars. I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, oh, you don't remember? You say when if I was pregnant, uh, you marry me. I'm like, I did. <laughs> that, that that's a big oversight, right? <laughs> for did, us. I, did I say that? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I'm obviously not the sharpest tool in the shed. Um, and I wanted a relationship if it was true with this, this new baby. So yeah. I didn't do a very good job on the first one. I was kind of immature trying to handle it, but I didn't know the woman for long. And yeah, she was a nightmare. Believe me, the first one. So with, with Florence, I, I, was, I said, Oh, I guess, you know? And so I um, flew her from Europe. I met her back in Canada at my farm. 
And then, um, and yeah, we got married. And then the baby was born on the set of A River Runs Through It in a motel room. And we were next to Brad Pitt. Yeah. And he, I could hear him, you know, at night talking to his agent and stuff. And he was the first guy, other than the midwife, Florence and myself, he was the first guy to actually see my baby when Morgan was, was first born. So that started this chain of events. Um, we went back to LA. I didn't get any work for like 10 or 11 months. I don't know why. Uh, I still didn't know anything about her or her family. Uh, once we were married, she just shut down completely. Um, I couldn't make her happy. Um, yeah, the long story short, I ended up being married to her for four and a half years, primarily for my children. Now, I will say this. When we were filming in Montana, um, Florence became very friendly with our next door neighbor, Mr. Pitt. And she actually arranged, arranged his itinerary for a trip that he was taking to Europe because he'd never been to Europe. You know, he's from Missouri. I don't think he'd ever been outside of, you know, Missouri, California kind of thing. So unless he you know, driving through maybe. But so, um, yeah, they were quite good friends. And it wasn't uh, that was then my, then my Florence was pregnant again. And. We had our daughter, Lily. Um, we decided, sold the house in LA, went back up to my farm, and then my daughter was born. And Florence had said the midwives couldn't make it, which was a lie. So I delivered my daughter, the two of us did. Like, you know, I'm reading instructions on how to deliver a baby. I'm like, okay, that makes it, oh yeah, okay, hot water, yeah, I got that. Wow. So Florence also didn't want to register the birth of Lily which makes sense now, but at the time I, I couldn't understand what, like we gotta get Lily's birth registered, like, come on. So um, when I count back on the arithmetic, which I never did out of respect for my daughter, who's now like 27, whatever, I never um, did the math on when she was conceived. And then I did the math and I wasn't in town for the three weeks when she was conceived. So I guess it could be mine, but, not too likely. And I know the time frame because it was during the L.A. riots. I was up in Canada trying to get these renters off this farm. And I'm, you know, watching TV at a friend's place where I'm staying. And I'm like, oh, my God, these riots in L.A. I phoning for, are you OK? Is Morgan OK? Like the dogs are there fires? Like, so I read right about a week after the or three days after the L.A. riots for Rodney King, I, I went back to L.A., but I was gone for the whole time frame of when she was conceived. And that only is interesting when you start to consider, well, then who could be the father? And who does she look like? But I'm going off on a tangent. So after three, four years, um, I discovered... I had come home unexpectedly and she had bruises on her face and with makeup, but she never wore makeup on the farm and she always dressed like the dowdy housewife kind of, even though I'd purchased her Dolce & Gabbana dresses and nice stuff, right? But she wouldn't wear it. She always kind of dressed down, which was fine, I guess. Um, but she had makeup on. I'm like, she's you're wearing makeup. And I look closer, I'm like, you got bruises. Why'd you get the bruises? And then she completely freaks out, calling me paranoid crazy you know all this stuff i'm like could have been anything i could have been a piece of wood in the in the in the barn it could have been the children's coloring books that they accidentally flung at you like you know it could be anything well short time later um my children tell me about men hitting mummy at a trailer at a gas station then she admits to being a prostitute um, I find out she's also doing this out of Toronto at a high, high class, high end hotel where I stay. And they had apartments above the hotel and directly across the street were the, um, the apartments for guys from Ottawa, whether you're a, like a senator or an MP, whatever. When you come to Toronto to, to do business, you can stay at this apartment complex across the street from this fancy hotel. So anyway, um, then uh, what happened after that was just, it's, a, it's, uh, it's shocking. I mean, I started having cars parked by the end of my drive. I'd go approach the car, I'd race off. I started getting fallen in traffic, same license plates. What's going on, you know? And then I took my son to a hotel. I was trying to get Lily a, a blood test. Um, I thought I'd like to know about, about that just to be, you know, 
Even though I hadn't done the math on counting back the dates of when she was conceived, I had a feeling, a strong feeling. And generally, as a creative person, my feelings are pretty good. So I had a feeling she wasn't mine, but um, no, I never did the math. So I went to get a blood test, and then agents and people are, you know, everyone's freaking out. Go back to the farm. Go back to the farm. And I don't understand why everyone's freaking out. So I went back. I went to Children's Aid. Because when I found out that children were under a blanket when mummy was with men, I became, I became kind of alarmed, right? But that's when it all, that's basically when it all started falling apart and insane 24 seven surveillance, death threats. Um, an incident happened where I had my son at a hotel in downtown Toronto at the Cambridge Suites Hotel. I'd left them alone for two minutes. I'd hid things because now stuff was disappearing, especially paperwork. And I was in the process in September, October of 95, I'd received in my fax machine papers on Lionsgate Entertainment because I had a partner in Vancouver, a lawyer, and I wanted to call it Rockland Pictures, but he was adamant that we call it Lionsgate. And he had venture capitalist money, so I acquiesced and said, okay, we can call it Lionsgate, I guess. Yeah. So all that paperwork disappeared right off the get-go, practically. Um, I, I had hidden stuff in the hotel room. I'd gone away. Of, of so w you, let me get this straight. You were a co-founder of Lionsgate Films? Well, yeah. Holy shit, dude. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's, uh, okay, keep going. Keep going. This is, this is really interesting, man. Yeah, so I didn't, my lawyer partner, this guy was a lawyer, right? Yeah. He told me, what he specialized in was insurance law, but he worked a lot with people from the Vancouver Stock Exchange. Vancouver Stock Exchange shut down because it was considered, like, think of the world, and Canada is always so nice and polite and honest. Vancouver Stock Exchange was known to be the most corrupt stock exchange in the world. And I knew guys that used to be coke dealers and stuff that overnight made like, you know, $20 million of driving Lamborghinis. I'm like, what, what, how did you pull this off? You didn't even finish high school. Oh man, I'm, I'm playing the stock market. And, you know, so my partner worked a lot with people from the stock market. And um, he worked with logging companies and really important mining companies. So which dude makes, made the most money off of mining companies on the Vancouver Stock Exchange? Hmm. I'd be pressed to be 100% sure, but I'd probably be 99% sure it would be Frank Justra, mm -hmm. the infamous contributor to the Clinton uh, Foundation, right? Yeah. But, you know, the hindsight's 2020. Like, at the time, I don't understand why my partner... Is, is being the way he is. And when I finally meet up with him in March of 96, um, he chooses a place where he had people on lookout, looking out for him. So I think he thought I might lunge across the table. But to be honest, I was so stunned, I couldn't believe it. He told me we didn't have a production company, that he wasn't my partner. His father, who ran CSIS, which is Canada's CIA, his father, apparently, according to him and his friends, his father had run CSIS. So I'm begging this guy, but can't your dad help me? Because at that point, my children had been threatened and stolen. Fascist. Fascism. Fascist. Oh, fascism. Fascist, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was perfectly tough. That was something on Twitter. Fascist, fascist, fascist. Yeah, we're, we're going to be talking about fascists for sure. <laughs> so back to when I had my son in the, in the hotel room. Left him alone two minutes, come back. My son's crying. There's a tall guy in a headset. Headsets were new then. And I, my concern is not this, this group in front of my hotel room. My concern is my, my four-year-old son. I go in, he's crying. I bought a micro cassette recorder that morning at the, um, what's it called? The Eaton Center. Anyway, so I record my son where he tells me he can't talk to me and he's crying. I'm not allowed to talk to you, daddy. The, the man's going to hurt, hurt, hurt me. Um, that whole thing within like a 24 hour cycle, I was tricked. My wife had shown up in the lobby. Anyway, I go looking for her and my son's stolen. My children are threatened to not talk to me. They're not allowed to talk to their daddy. 
Uh, the, the wife goes off to the abuse center claiming I abused her. And um, I'm basically in it. And for most part, the next four or five years, pretty much 24 seven surveillance. I can safely say that because I don't go through that anymore, but I did. Uh, and it was out of this world. So, but back to the, the, the Lionsgate stuff. So yeah, this guy, when I met him in that place where he had guys on a lookout, um, he says, his father can't help me. I, I say, why? He goes, my father spent his whole life killing people. And then the last thing the guy says to me, which honestly, I wish I punched him in the head, but I was so stunned. He told me to forget about my kids or I was dead. Wow. So that, you know, that, that's, that's kind of the story. Um, and then there's guesswork involved in, you know, why my ex-wife has dissociative identity disorder, which I didn't understand then, which Kim has witnessed, five personalities in three minutes, different mannerisms, different voices. Um, who set her on me? I don't know. Could have been the guys in Canada I pissed off. But then why it transferred to L.A.? And I got to say this, every agent or producer that I'd known and worked with, and I was kind of well-liked, right? Um, every single person pretty much told me, forget about your kids and maybe you'll work again. Or forget about your effing kids and maybe you'll work again. And I'm, you know, I'm on the receiving end of a phone hearing this thinking, who are these animals? Like... Who are these people? Like, how am I expected to forget about my kids? Exactly. How is any father expected to forget about his kids in order for him to work again? So I ended up homeless by 97, I guess, right? I was living in, Ven in Venice Beach, um, sleeping on the boardwalk. I kind of gave up on the sleeping on the benches after I saw a guy get stabbed with a screwdriver for five bucks. So, Jeez. But I got along good with homeless. I, that actually made me feel good. I got some self-esteem that I could survive this. I could lose every family member, every friend. The world thought I was completely mentally ill just for telling the truth about cars running up sidewalks after me, the death threats I was getting, the safety box branches, three safety box break-ins in three different bags. Yeah. And now I've been told, oh, no, yeah, we know that that that's possible. I'm like, back in 96, 97, I'm like, wait a second. I thought banks were secure. I thought, you know, I'm the only one with the safety box key. There's always two. There's always a master key, man. Wow. And you, remember, I told you the story about my, my mother-in-law safety box getting cleared out. Yeah. No, that actually makes me feel great. Yeah. Sad for your mother. But at least it's a confirmation that I'm not the only guy in the world that's ever had this happen to him. Yeah, I was the one that got blamed for it, remember? <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, the big thing. You love that one. Yeah, right? Yeah. So um, I was going to mention, it's up to you, but I could mention, like, I'm barely treading water. But thank God, other than one time when I was shipped off to do a movie in France, um, uh, I've never been suicidal. Yeah. Um, in the very beginning, when I'd left to do the film in France, the children and the, and the wife were still on the farm. I had called everybody, man. I mean, you can tell I still, I'm 63. I still have kind of crazy kinetic energy. But I mean, you know, calling anybody, man, it's like you're drowning and you want to like, wow, give me a rope, someone, anyone, you know. So I called a good friend of mine. I'd been with her when she won casting director award of the year at the Beverly Hilton Hotel. They don't have an Academy Award for casting directors. I think they should. Yeah. But um, her name well, was- Casting like, directors really, really make the film. They're like, they're like the architect of the drama and the action if you really think about it, right? Well, outside of your leads, and usually those are in place by a CAA package or a yep. William Morris package. Other than those leads, all those supporting roles and smaller roles, Man, you, you know, you, you watch a movie and, and really bad supporting actors, it's like, it wrecks it. Yep. It really wrecks it. She yep. was so thorough when she did Dances with Wolves for Kevin Costner. On her own dime, she flew into North or South Dakota 
and and she would go to the um, like the Aboriginal, the Native guys' hotel rooms, motel rooms, hotel rooms to make sure they had their accent and dialect down right. Wow! Like, how thorough she was. Yeah. I was crossing the street from that little motel where Scott Pitt's my next door neighbor. I'm crossing the street, not a car in sight. There was a, sh a supermarket across the street. It's in Livingston, Montana. Well, Elizabeth takes my arm, you know, like this. And I'm like, what are you doing? She goes, I don't just want to be, I just want to be careful. And I'm like, Elizabeth, we're in Livingston, Montana. There's not a car in sight. Relax. Okay, that is, that's an important bit because this Elizabeth stuff is something else. So I'm calling everyone. It's October, November. Did she know what was going on with you? I had left her a message, and I'd said, because she knew me. She cast me in a river, runs through it. She actually set up my birthday party after I'd done a river, runs through it. She organized my birthday party, but wouldn't let me invite Brad Pitt, who I actually got along with, so that's bizarre. Mm. But she was, uh, she was really, I, I would consider her like one of my good friends. I didn't have many in industry types as friends. <clears throat> I got along with people, but I made an ex exception with Elizabeth because she was just, I mean, it sounds corny, but man, she was such a beautiful person inside and out, like just, just a, an amazing, great person. And she was French. So I'd encourage my wife to talk to her and stuff because they're both French in France, right? Anyway, so I'd left her a message. That whole film in France where we shot, um, in, in November, in October, October 95, this is like right after my son's been stolen from the hotel. I suddenly get a, an offer. I say, I can't work. I can't work. The agent threatens me with a lawsuit if I don't take the job. And I'm like, what? So I go and do this thing. They pay me more money than my going rate was. Like they were obviously getting me out of town, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so I find out at the hotel in Paris that this woman I married had been working at that hotel, like a four or five star exclusive boutique hotel. The night manager, because I'd gone in the evening, he told me that they knew that she was sleeping with um, guests for money and jewelry. Now, the guests were mostly um, like Arabic uh, ambassadors, like high-powered people from Saudi Arabia, you know, Dubai, whatever. Um, that was the clientele of the home. That was like their clientele. So how is some little girl at the reception allowed to work like that? And they all know. I got lots of theories on it. Um, and I was told she was French intelligence CIA asset, which makes sense. <laughs> yeah. You don't get to work in a hotel and do that. Yeah. You know, I know that because I went back and stayed at another one of their chain hotels and they said absolutely the person would be fire on the spot. So <clears throat> anyway, I fly but, from Paris to New York City. Isn't that ironic? You worked in that show. Was it La Femme Nikita? <laughs> oh, I got low footage. You know I'm saying? I'm in my trailer reading my dialogue. For that. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, I'm reading my dialogue, I'm going, I've had this conversation with Florence. Like, what is going on, man? Well, what a coincidence that is. Like, I've actually had this conversation with her. So uh, who knows what the game was? I know the guy that Joel Cerno that produced and wrote, I guess, La Fonda Kid, the TV show. Um, he's heavily connected, I believe. He also did with, with the agencies, right? Yeah. I also did, um, what's the one with Keith Ruth Sullivan, the 24? 24. Yeah, he specializes in the spook stuff, right? Yeah. Jeez, yeah. what is that? And mm. I've been working years, and they suddenly want to throw me in this TV show. I'd done one episode years earlier, and they bring me back out of nowhere. But no one else will hire me, and I'm fired from all ages. And I'm like, to play a guy that, that take, they take into section, which would be like CIA, uh, and they programmed. They yeah. literally say that. They programmed me to be compliant and be on their side. Because originally I was a cop looking for the truth. Just like me in life looking for the truth. Tell me that wasn't a fucking message right in your face. Oh, absolutely. They love it, though. Because then that Joel Cerno sits down at me with lunch. And, and he's like, yeah, you got all these people fooled. I'm like, what do you mean? Well, they seem to like you. I'm like, Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, it was almost like the whole thing was just a mind uh, fuck. And yeah. they got me out of their sight. They gave me a driver. I've been homeless like a, a week or two weeks earlier in Toronto because I finally left LA and come back to Canada. And I was literally sleeping outside at City Hall on these benches. And um, so, but all of a sudden they give me a driver. But the driver, even on my days off, the guy's calling me, where are you going? What are you doing? I'm like, oh, more of this shit. Like, honestly, really? Isn't this tiresome, kind of? Like, come on, man. Oh, anyway, so here's the Elizabeth stuff, and then I'll be able to calm down. Um, so Elizabeth, I get to New York. I've now had confirmation in Paris that she slept with these wealthy Arabs for money or jewelry. They let her do it. I get into New York. I got a message from Elizabeth. She says something like, Hi, Stephen, it's Elizabeth. It's very important that um, I see you uh, face to face. I have something I have to tell you. Uh, but I don't want to do over the phone. Wow, my God, man. I, I've already been gaslit, followed, death threatened, like, you know, treated terrible on that thing in France, never been treated worse. I'm like, yeah, I want to find out. Well, yeah. So I, of course, I, um, they, they stole my luggage. I finally got it back. And then as soon as I got my luggage, I went out to LA and this girl, I won't say too much about her, but she's the one that knew Fincher and those guys. And she was a call girl, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Anyway, she begging me out of nowhere. I didn't even know I was coming to town. She's giving me messages. Um, can we stay here with me? I'll even drive my car. You can stay in my house. You know, I want to see you. I want to see you, you know. So I get out to LA and I start looking for Elizabeth Lusky. And I can't find her. She's, her, her secretary or her assistant said, at the last second, she got called out of town that she was casting the movie The Saint. And they were filming in Mo Moscow. And at the last second, she'd been pulled out of town. So I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, that's the reason I came out here, man. Was to, to stay here. She had to see me to tell me something. Like, oh, man. So I'm not sleeping at all. I'm just. Yet, yet another spook movie, The Saint. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> just followed me around for years. So um, I, I'm not sleeping. I'm drinking way too much. So I went to my gym and I worked out. I had a good hard workout. You know, like I'm still thinking I can, I can sort of transform this. I can, I can, you know, I can, I can, uh, you know, I can get over this. I can, you know, I can somehow overcome it. So, but I'm getting literally cars following me constantly. Same license plates, but no one cares. I try to tell people they don't care. They just think you're nuts. We get out of the gym and I phone in for my messages on a pay phone. And it's an agent from APA, Agency of Performing Arts, who had been my agents, but I was no longer with them. And it was from an agent, a woman who was never my agent. I don't even remember knowing this woman. But she asked me to call her back. It's important. Okay, so I call APA. I ask, I get the secretary. I'm like, hi, it's Steve Schellen. I'm phoning. Oh, she wants to talk to you. I'm like, what's going on now? Like, why, 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 what now, right? Um, and I just, anyway, so I phone her back. I phone her, rather, and I, and I speak to her. And she goes, I've got bad news for you, Steve. And I'm like, okay. She goes, it's about Elizabeth Lusty. Okay. She goes, well, Elizabeth, Elizabeth is dead. What? I'm like, what? Yes, Stephen. She was in Moscow, and apparently she wandered out into traffic and was hit by a car. They say she might have been drinking. And I say to this agent, Elizabeth didn't even ever have more than a glass of wine whenever I had dinner. She was the farthest thing removed from a, from a drunk. And her being so cautious, she's just going to wander out into the... No. But I try to keep a lid on it. And then I ask her... Um, because my wife and my two children are, they haven't been stolen yet. They're still up on my farm. But I'm actually literally afraid to go back to that farm. And 25 years later, you know, I'm not a wuss. I was smart to not go back to the farm because I probably would have been suicided. Um, so I say to this agent in a nice possible way, I obviously, you know, give her my condolences. I thank her for calling. And I say, oh, by the way, did you phone my farm up in Canada um, looking for me? And she says, yes. Well, yes, I did. I said, did you talk to my wife? 
Yes. And I say, oh, okay, did you happen to mention to her about Elizabeth Lucy? Well, I'm sorry, Stephen, but I wasn't sure I was going to be able to reach you. So that, yes, I, I told her about Elizabeth and her death. For another month, Laurence and the children were on my farm. I'm getting track ball and mess with constantly, the death threats, all the insane stuff, right? Paperwork gone. I'd made copies of that last conversation on the micro cassette that I have with my four-year-old. Packages are opened, damaged. Uh, three times I sent it the same place. They never get there. I've got UPS saying, this never happens. This never has happened before. Same thing with FedEx. All my packages, all my mail was being intercepted, right? Um, phone calls also to human rights organizations. I get re-diverted to another phone. I don't know that. And when I go in the office, because I found the office is a safer bet than doing it over the phone, I've got the person's name that told me they could never help me and, and told me to go away, basically. And I'm like, I asked for the guy, and they say, there's no one by that name that's ever worked here. So the only thing I can think is, when I was phoning these human rights groups, whatever, all my phones are intercepted, right? You're going, they're transferring your calls to Langley, probably. <laughs> or something like that. So the fact that I asked the agent, did you tell my wife, it's important only because I wait for... Well, I actually wait for two years. Now, she steals the children as soon as I get on a plane. But obviously, someone tipped her off because I didn't tell anyone I was going back. Yeah. January 2nd. She had left January 1st with my children, even though I'd hired attorneys to pre prevent her from taking the children out of the country. The attorney, whose husband was a big shot politician, politician, he just hap she just happened to file in the wrong County, come on, she knew exactly where I lived. We talked about my farm on the corner, you know, like she knew where I lived. Anyway, so I asked him if I uh, ever told Florence, Yes, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to reach him. So I phoned Florence for the next month or two, and then they she stole the children. I found them in France. My children, in one month, were one month in France. They no longer spoke any English. And, and people are telling me that it can happen. I'm like, we in, in a month? Three -year -old and a three year old. And in one month, they lose their first language, English, and they can't talk to their daddy. So, anyway, um, Florence never, all the phone calls, when I'm, she was still on the phone, your asshole friend Scott name called, or D -D Jerry called you. She'd give me the messages. The only one she didn't give me was about Elizabeth. One, wow. Christ one Christmas, I'm on a boat, and I'm living with this guy that used to be my doorman, and his dad was like, a, I don't know if he was a made man, but his dad was involved in mafios and stuff. His dad was serving a life, a life sentence for murdering the guy and putting him in an oil drug. But drastic, I know. But I've been homeless and stuff. I meet up with Tarassi, and we get on this boat in Marina del Rey, and there's a landline on the boat. So one Christmas, I dig around, and I find where I think my kids are, and I phone. Florence answers. And it's really hard to be cordial with that kind of evil. Um, but I, I tried. And I said to her, because I had Tarassi as a witness. I learned over the years, never do anything unless you got a witness. Like, People just think you're flat out nuts. Yeah. So Tracy's there in front of me, and I asked Florence, you know, Florence, I was just wondering, um, why didn't you ever tell me about uh, the death of Elizabeth Lucy? She starts screaming, saying, like, pathetic. You're speaking, you're speaking, you're speaking, you're crazy, you're mentally ill, you're pathetic, click. Well, I'm kind of used to these kind of reactions, right? Whenever I'm near the truth. But Tarassi, who's, you know, been around guys that murder people and stuff in Pittsburgh, Tarassi's sitting across the table and his eyes are like saucer. And I'm hanging off the phone and Tarassi says to me, Shellen, Shellen. <laughs> she was either on it or she arranged it, but she directly involved in the death of Elizabeth. Those and I tried over the years. You know, I did benefits. I had a party once at Shane Black's house 
for uh, for a guy called Jack Healy. Jack Healy ran Amnesty International, right? He did the whole African tour thing, right? Good buddies with Bono and all these other dickheads, right? Yeah. Do you think Jack Healy ever lifted even a finger for me when I was begging him to help me get my children back? No. And, and he... How he came in my life was kind of weird to begin with. So, you know, I, I, I really don't know. Um, yeah. You know, man, I'm starting to believe that most of these people out front in these organizations, they're, they're just gatekeepers and fronts for the, all this kind of nonsense. You yeah. Know, human trafficking and slavery and the more nefarious I stuff. Know, I don't know if they are. I don't know if they're all fully aware of the, the child trafficking, uh, you know, the extent of it. I mean, maybe it's just a hopefulness in me because I would find it hard to believe that all of these organizations and many NGOs are child trafficking folks, right? I got something to say about that too. So, yeah. But I want to believe that humanity's better than them. I really do. I just want to believe that some people are either. I don't want to say coerced, but maybe they're not let in on the inner circle about what's really going on with Clinton Foundation, what's really going on. But yeah, Amnesty International. You know, 25 years ago, I thought, oh, Amnesty, man, they do so much good. They work with the UN. Well, now I'm like, you know, you couldn't beg me to go to the UN, go contact Amnesty. I wouldn't go near any of these charlatans. But yeah, it's sad to say, and even our truth community, and the popular YouTube channels, I think many of those are also um, compromised somehow, you know. And then the good ones get get taken down usually, or, or they they only get like oh seven hundred views, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like my channel. <laughs> but, you know, honestly, and I've spoken to someone else who went through something similar to me. The journalist that I say if you wrote an article about me in my film. Yeah, and that was a great, a great article too. That was really good. She knows how to write, boy, and she's a, she's a brave woman. But um, yeah, she says now. She, I think it was something like, if if videos don't get very many views, I have a tendency to trust those channels more than the others. You know, because <laughs> your natural, your natural instinct is, oh my god, this video, it's a trooper video, it's got five hundred thousand views, you know. Yeah. It must be real. It must be good. And they ignore me for the most part. Um, you know, but yeah, Jack Healy never did a, a, a thing for me. He got, he, Maria, the, the, if she was a call girl anyway, I think she was. She went and worked for him uh, doing what I don't know. Like, and all these charity work. So, bringing up charities. Kim and I are in Montreal. It's about 2009, was it? Anyway, just out of habit or curiosity, every once in a while, every year or two, whatever, I'll do a Google search on Florence Shelley because she wasn't even my name. This website comes up, and it's a it's an orphanage in Scenicville, Cambodia, and there's a bios of all the people involved. Well, Florence is one of the co-founders of this orphanage. Now, she's convinced my family that she cleans houses for a living, right? And yet she's managed to take time off from cleaning houses to go to Cambodia and open up this orphanage. Scenicville, Cambodia. So we dig around, and the name of it was Book With No Borders. And Books With No Borders, it sounds like a legitimate organization called Books Without Borders or Doctors Without Borders. <clears throat> the difference is it doesn't say without, it says with no. And when you look at their funding and how they've got all these uh, buildings and stuff, the, the, the two guys with her were two brothers from Australia and her, and they raised like, what was it, like 800 pounds, English uh, pounds, like the equivalent of like, you know, I don't know, $1,400 or something. Yeah. It's like they managed that little money to have this layout and they named one of the houses Florence House, Happy House. It's Happy House because it's Florence House. And then the bio on her, and they mentioned me, and they mentioned me like I'm a dead person. So sad they lost their father, their children. It was unreal. So I did a radio interview. I know. 
you imagine like this stuff just doesn't go away. So I did a radio interview with this girl on a Truther channel. And um, I mentioned the orphanage and I'm like, yeah, look it up. Books with no borders. Well, I don't know if I credit a frenzy, but the people, she was quite popular, the, popular, the people listening to her show, they get on their computers, books with no borders. They're like, holy cow, he's not kidding. And so they start digging around and find out all kinds of stuff, like what a front it was, what a phony orphanage it was. And that at that time in the world, 2009, 2010, um, Cambodia and this area, Scenicville in particular, it was like the number one tra uh, trafficking hub in the world. Is that insane? So after these people dug around on the website, disappeared, man. Within a week, it'd be doing the radio show. Gone. Gone. No sign of it. They <laughs> So, yeah, you have to wonder. I guess Florence was involved in child trafficking as well. Yeah. You know, and as far as hurting someone or something, I saw her try, try to drown a kitten, an eight-week-old eight kitten in front of my children. I was furious. I saved the kitten's life, but I didn't understand why my children were um, uh, passively sitting on the, gra on the grass watching the kitten drowning in the aquarium that I put outside and it filled with rainwater. Well, of course, when you look into ritual abuse and you start understanding what programming is, yeah. oh, okay, that's why. But at the time, I'm like, you know, I'm furious with her. Give me some towels. Give me some towels. Because she, I'd scream, get it out of the, um, I was in the house. She was outside. I bang it on the window. Look at the, the kitten, the kitten in the aquarium. She slowly walks to the aquarium, takes out the little kitten, and then slowly walks towards the house. And then right before the, the back door of this old farmhouse, she drops it at breast level, like onto the concrete slab. And I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? She goes, it's dead anyway. And she shrugs and goes inside. But see, I had no reference on why my son was afraid of poo, why he'd be toilet potty trained. And I'd come back and he's not again, not trained again. Uh, why he was afraid of cameras, why he was afraid of adult men, like he, sh he would shake. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say this because they are my kids and they're still alive, but, you know, there's a lot of indications that make me believe that something pretty nefarious was going on. This involves a generational family. It also involves the entertainment business. It certainly involves politicians. And yeah, it involves, uh, you know, things like amnesty. So if amnesty does 60, 70% of what looked like good works, but then they got like 30%, probably less, but they got 30% of just wicked stuff. That wouldn't surprise me, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like, it, it, it's hard not to see all of our lives and all of, all of this world right now it's hard to look at look at it not in a spiritual light because it is it's like even I feel a little guilty doing this because I'm talking about my story, whereas I've got a lot to say about a lot of things that don't necessarily include me in it, and you know things I've learned and, and you know meeting Gunderson and stuff like that, but I feel guilty only because the world right now is in a trauma is in is in a, a trauma based uh, you know program. Uh, have, you know, whatever, like, you know, and it, it's just insane. Like, I don't know what's happened to our world. I just, maybe it was always, I mean, what do you think? Do you think, was it just really always bad and then we just didn't see it before? That, that's a, that's a deep question, man. I think I, and I have my own journey of what I would call waking up to reality. Um, I think one of our first conversations you and I had, you know, we talked about 9-11, about how that mass casualty event, they, I mean, they traumatized right. millions of people. Right. And that emotional and spiritual trauma, like, opens you up to, to be programmed. And, and what did most Americans do? We're like, go get those evil yeah. Islamic bastards, right? That's right. Well... You know, most of us in the truth community know it was an inside job. And the 
the Muslims were patsies. They franchised because they need they needed Absolutely. the war on terror. I mean, right? I have. Yeah. So well, my problem was with stuff. It sort of slowed down for me, and I was living in northern Quebec uh, with Sarah Perhadi, a nice little you know, Quebec walk girl. And I was just like doing what I could do for money and doing short films. I'd never made short films before, but there was a festival up there. And so 9-11 happened when I was in her office, it was on TV and there, um, she was a graphic artist. And we're all in the office watching it. I teared up and I was like, wow. On the way home, um, I start thinking, man, that was like a Brookheimer movie. And I'd worked once with Brookheimer. I didn't know him. But God, Brookheimer's the last guy. Brookheimer was having a party. I will so I absolutely not be at that party. You know, I'd be peeing in his planner, whatever. You know, I would I just completely mess it up. I was invited once to meet Brookheimer at the screening of this dumb movie I did, Gone in 60 Seconds. And I'm like, oh no, 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 I'm not meeting Brookheimer. If he asked me what, what I think, I'm gonna tell him the truth that it's garbage. I mean, I like muscle cars as much as anyone, but. Come on, man. That was that, that was Nick Cage and, and who else? Right. So um, Nick Cage, Angelina Jolie, um, James Conn, son, I think. I don't know. It was And you you, know, you were you were in it and you know, just, Yeah. For a split second because I met the director and I guess that was the last film I did in Hollywood. And I think he just threw me a bone for a day. Which was great because I made money on these intervals um, until Screen Actors Guild said I wasn't in it and they couldn't send me any money. And I'm like, what? I said, I'm listed in IMDb. That doesn't matter, sir. It doesn't matter. I'm like, they needed my pay stubs from the actual job. I'm like, this was like four or five years ago. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Finally, after half a year, a year, battling with Screen Actors Guild, they finally agreed to give me my residual. And it's so stupid. It's like, go to IMDb or better yet, watch the movie. And then, you know, with your computers, grab screen, grab a photo of me and look at my guy I play in the dumb movie. Like, come on. Anyway, 9-11, I go home and I write this whole dissertation. I got to ask you real quick. Are, are you still in the Screen Actors Guild? Yeah. Okay. They lightened up. No, I don't really, I don't really get, you know, they did what they had to do to me, obviously, right? Now they've yeah. got a little worry about it. Yeah. Like all the true community waking up, right? <laughs> like, I'm not that important anymore. They still <laughs> put me down, but they don't. But no, I went home and wrote this letter to myself, and it basically said, we're going to use this to invade all our privacies. It wasn't what they're telling us, and blah, 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 blah. Well, Quebec doesn't like Anglophones much, for this part of Quebec. Like, they're, they're kind of renegades of bit people out there. And yet, they hey, you are uh, you are American right? asshole, right? <laughs> this trauma, they all want. Yeah, who's who's claiming it's not what they're telling us? How insensitive, Stephen. You know, <laughs> but yeah, uh, look what happened. I said they're gonna put. They're gonna... <laughs> so they all hate me. I mean, I've spent so many years being hated. It's really quite remarkable. Oh, man. But then uh, the Patriot Act is in your juice shortly thereafter, right? Yeah. They're going to do to everyone what they did to me. Yep. You know, just destroy, try, like, you have no privacy. But people don't value privacy until it's gone. Exactly. America, <laughs> Canada, these countries, it's going to be some huge awakenings. And I, I hate to say it, I think a lot of suicide. Because not everyone's that resilient, you know? Nope. You lose your business, you lose your home, and, you know, and then you, you've got no privacy anymore. Um, you know, you're, you're done. Like, there'll be suicides. I don't want to see it. I think there really needs to be a whole bunch of money. If the government wants to spend some money, spend it on, like, getting people to, getting psychologists to specialize in trauma counseling. Yeah. Because that's what you need. All these industries, the factories, they need trauma specialists, man. And everybody should have to go in and at least do a, uh, like an introduction course or a day or an afternoon, whatever, you know? Yeah. Because, you know, this is going to, this is just impacting everybody. We all went along with it because we all thought it'll pass and it'll go away. 
Yeah. Let's see guys like us. We're going to be like, fucking told you. Right now. <laughs> right now. <laughs> Seriously, we're, we're going to be fine because they're like, yeah, dude, we've been dealing with the trauma for years. We've been doing our own self-therapy. <laughs> yeah. I actually do see a therapist now for PTSD. Mm -hmm. So if anyone says, it looks like he's done cocaine, because, you know, assholes in the comments, I still get those. Maybe there's some a little legit, but a lot of them are probably alphabet idiots, right? Yeah. Well, I get these comments. It looks like he's on he's on speed. That guy's obviously on speed. Look at his tense muscle. No, I got PTSD, okay, for any assholes out there that want to, like, try to slam me for having way too much energy. I got PTSD, and I'm doing the best I can. Yeah. <laughs> I'm right there with you, man. Oh, good Lord. Well, you know, it's... It... You know, people don't realize also that uh, if all these movies are about spies, uh, why is it so hard to believe that I could have been married to a spy at that time? Like, why is that? Like, isn't it weird that I've been... I, I, like, I'm homeless, and I meet people with a homeless... And I tell them I'm in River Runs through it. Is that easier to believe than me saying I was married to a spy assassin? It seems like it. Yeah. Whereas you think that loser guy, he's homeless. He was never in any movie with Robert Redford directing. Come on. He's obviously. <laughs> but well, no. and, and here's the perfect segue because you mentioned that uh, the director Black, what's his name? Alan, Alan Black? Shane Black. Shane Black. Okay, that's right. So. You find out some years later that he reaches out to Florence and she's involved in writing the screenplay for that movie, Long Kiss Goodnight with Gina Davis and Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, and I, I think it's funny that, you know, uh, you know, maybe I brought up 9-11 or you did, I don't remember, but there's a, there's a, a story in the screenplay yeah. where they allude to what? That bringing down the towers. All those people are going to die. Two or tell, three t tell me that's a fucking oh, coincidence, please. Of course not. But how that went down is I was still with Florence. It wasn't retro. It retro, wasn't. I found out. No. This was May of 95. Uh, no, maybe March 95. Yeah. The girl in L.A. Who's, who works with... Uh, um, uh, Healy now and the girl that knew Shane Black and David Fincher. That girl who had the lunch uh, pool party when I brought my Hell's Angel friend like an idiot, you know. <laughs> 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 and we sat with Jack Daniels. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, what an idiot. What a bonehead. Who brings the Hell's Angel to a Hollywood party? That's funny, dude. Uh, I'm it, sorry. It is but, funny. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> So that girl, um, she calls me up and she goes, Hi, hey, Steven. She took like a little girl, um, like a four year old or something. Hey, Steven, um, Shane wants to talk to you. And I'm like, Shane? Shane Black. I'd met Shane maybe two or three times. I didn't know him well. Yeah. I'd met Fincher a couple of times. I didn't know him well. But so I get this call and Shane wants to talk to me. I'm like, can, can you call him? I'll give you his number or whatever it was. So, yeah, I go, okay, sure, I'll call. Pull him up. Hey, she, hey it's Jane Black. Same as this. Steve Jones gets him the phone right away. Hey, Steven, how are you? I'm like, I'm all right. You know, what's going on? Dude? It seems a little bit odd. Like, yeah. that, I never came across as thinking I was the greatest thing since sliced bread or anything, right? I mean, I won't even go into his own personality and his family and all the medication they take and stuff. But I was a little girl, I think, for that guy. Um, you know, alpha male-ish, maybe. I don't know. Uh, maybe not now, but certainly yet. So anyway, I'm like, yeah, what's up, Shane? He goes, well, I'm writing this screenplay, and, I, and, I, and I'd like, I might have, I think I've got some French I can translate. And I'm like, okay. And he says, yeah, I'd like to talk to your, your wife is French, right? And I'm like, Florence, yeah, yeah, she's from France. Yeah. Could I contact her and have her help me with this? But keep in mind, this is before computers really, were, everyone had a computer, before we had text messaging, right? Mm -hmm. Land, these landlines, people use landlines. So I go, yeah, sure, I give him the number, the landline number on the farm. And uh, 
Oh, I also say, oh, congratulations, by the way, because the script he was working on, it was in the trades, a variety, Hollywood before, whatever. It was the highest paid amount of money ever paid for a spec script. A spec script is not the finished script. It's just like the storyline of what the film's going to be about. Like, yeah, I don't know, where are they, 20 pages? something like that and he had got some absorbent amount of money i'm guessing i think it was it was something crazy like five million yeah but because he'd written lethal weapon he he gets this idea and then they give him all this money to write the screenplay so that's the thing he was working on so i like sure you can you can talk to her and I give him the number and that's it we hang up and stuff um a couple months later uh she had come down from the farm i'd sold my house by the hollywood sign years before so we were going to stay in a hotel, and he offered to put us up at his house because he bought a bigger house that he moved into. And I said, sure, you know, that'd be great, thanks. And that's when I had an, another party for Jack Healy uh, at that house. But the movie, um, finally, I finally got to see the film, and it came out around the same time, I think, of, like, conspiracy theory. Oh, this is a little... Did it? Yeah. This is a little great tidbit. So I'm now sleeping in bus shelters, Right to avoid the insanity and stuff. I don't know who to trust. It's, my life is completely, you know, insane, right? And I'm sleeping in a bus, bus shelter occasionally. And guess what's behind me on the, on the bus shelter? The movie poster. Conspiracy theory. <laughs> Speaking of woke Hollywood, do you, do you know Mel Gibson? No, I wish I did. Yeah, Mel, uh, Mel definitely knows what's going on. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, his only, I don't even want to say it's a problem, but yeah, he said some shit that he obviously shouldn't have said, but I, I think they were gunning for him anyway, you know? Yeah. They don't gun for Jared Leto and Brad Pitt like that. But they no. were gunning for him, yeah, for sure. But yeah, yeah so I, I finally see Long Kiss Goodnight, um, and I'm looking at the film. Now, my kids have been stolen. I've lost all my properties, my, my wealth. It's all gone. My career's over. And I'm watching... Uh, um, the film, Long Kiss Goodnight, and I'm going, there's no French subplot, there's no French character. Now, granted, there could have been something French in it, and then in editing, they shot it, they took it out. I mean, all these things are possible, but there's nothing remotely, anything remotely French in the film, right? There's nothing, no French subplot, no French, like, so, um, and then, yeah, I noticed the 9-11, yeah, that's a good thing, man, for anyone that doesn't know that that is in there, what, six years or four or five years before. Yeah. I think it was four years before. Yeah. Crazy. But anyway, so here's the thing. Um, Kim and I get together 17 years ago, and I tell her a little bits, bits and pieces of my story. At the time, she, other than the, the medical profession, she pretty much trusted people. I thought Bill, Bill Clinton was cool with his sack. Uh oh, I hope I didn't lose you. <laughs> she said to shallow what she went for. Oh, oh yeah. God, I've got you. Okay, yeah, your signal got got red. Let's see. I can see your internet connection okay. got no. Now it's going to yellow. It's a little better. So you were saying um, Kim trusted anyway, Clinton? Yeah, yeah. Just that how how what a remark like Kim's remarkable in that. She's gone from almost 0 0.01 as far as truth stuff, like even though she's always wanted truth, but now it's, she sees everything so much clearer. Like she sees it all even before me out. Yeah. Even more than half. So I tell her about the long kiss goodnight, Shane Black, who didn't really like me much, wanted to talk to my wife and stuff. And Kim says, asks the obvious question. It's like, he's the highest paid writer in the world at the time. He's got offices in Universal or, or wherever. Burbank, like, why the fuck? Why, why would he need to talk to your wife that he's never met? He can have translation services, and there is a big French community in in LA. He mm -hmm. could have translation services at his door in like 15, 20 minutes, half an hour. Like, you know, like what he's gonna ask some some actor guy that he barely knows to talk to his wife, and she wasn't perfectly fluent, certainly not her writing. And how'd you do the translation over a landlord? You know what I mean? 
Yeah. Well, she still maintains that, but there was an Iron... I think he directed or wrote Iron Man 3, but it was a blog, and some guy I don't know... Do you remember his name? Some guy we don't know wrote on this blog that um, Shane Black... Um, um, Florence Schoen, ex-wife of actor Stephen Schoen, was French intelligence CIA asset, and that Shane Black had her trigger words, and he used her while writing Long Kiss Goodnight to unlock some, some information. Do, do we have access to this, our, this vlog? Yeah, Iron Man 3, Shane Black, Florence Schoen. Okay, dude, that is totally fucking nuts, man. And here's the other funny thing on this. So I wrote in the blog, hey, man, I don't know. You could be right. I mean, you know, and I, I don't know what I ever... Anyway, Florence knew about it immediately. She comes back and she does her natural thing. He's pathetic. He's a loser. He convinces people. He's very persuasive. Oh, he's a, he's a, screw that, screw that, screw that, whatever she does, right? And then this other person who was supporting me basically just kept saying or reiterating the you know, see my above uh, comment. Anyway, I, I lambasted her with about a paragraph and a half, and I never heard back from her after that. But it's interesting because you will see it. It's quite a few comments to go through, but uh, it will show up. If you've got that link bookmarked, I, I'm not finding it here. Um, and isn't it, isn't it interesting, the, uh, the antagonist in that film, a friend of mine told me a very, very interesting story about Mr. Tough Guy. You know, I'm talking about Mickey Rourke. Okay. Um, and, and I'll tell you that offline. So it's, it's, it's not something I can share online, but I don't think you'll be surprised. <clears throat> But it does tie into this whole uh, whole idea of some black nobility in in the Luciferian underworld in in Hollywood. Like they're really, really. I mean, where we're at now in 2020, it's like you 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 got to have your head buried in the sand not to know what's going on, or it's it, it's getting to the point where you're you're willfully ignoring things at some level. But but it, at the same time. I feel for people because it's so much cognitive dissonance to try to re reprogram your own sense of reality. Like this, like all these films and you know, you know, I, I'm, I'm in film school. I want to make movies, but I want to make movies that are good for people that tell good stories that it's, it, you know, good, com good overcoming evil. No, uh, let's program and traumatize the masses undertone in my film. That's not what I want to do. Cause I think, you know, storytelling is, is a significant part of, of human culture. It, it has to be done. We have to be able to tell good stories and, and make a difference and make a good impact. But, man, uncovering all this stuff, I'm just like, geez, man. What yeah, you can't is, break it up. That's too uh, Oh, you can't, you can't hear what I'm saying? Oh, uh, network bandwidth. Oh, I man. can go in and out, but I kind of have filled in the blanks. I think I've got the gist wall of Okay. I don't right. know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. <sighs> Let's see what is going on. Let me check my head. Yeah. I think it's changed. You know, in the last 20 years, all really changed. I'm going to put my phone in airplane mode. It's sitting next to my computer. Hopefully it's not causing problems. Oh, that cleared things up a little bit. Can okay, you... that is better. That is a lot better. Yeah. I think my phone might have been interfering. Okay. <laughs> yeah, about, about like, you, you know, you're a young, you're a young guy, you're excited about film, you've made a couple of little short films with your friends in high school, and you're, you're all jazzed about you know, getting out to Hollywood and, and, and working for someone and discovering this wonderful thing and called filmmaking. And it's, I, I think 20, 30 years ago, maybe I'm just way too much of an optimist. I don't think it was this bad. I, I don't think there's very, very few films. They're going to have to obviously now change it. 
but there's very few films that just have like just Tim and I look for them just a nice storyline just a you know without a girl without Angelina Jolie with horns on her head you know yeah, like yeah. typically me does it get does not, it get more satanic than that no, <laughs> no. I was so good in that you know oh man <clears throat> I mean, my film, I wish it, it could have been on Netflix, but now as I learn more about Netflix, uh, it's probably just as well. They're never going to touch me with a 10-foot pole, you know, and no. cuties. I mean, that's just unbelievable. Like, and that's, that's somebody else that makes you want to question because what's up with Redford? Yeah. You know, my ex-wife was so cozy with um, Brad Pitt, and then on the set, she wanted to visit and um, she was supposed to wear sensible shoes. She wore like white spike heels. She's nine months pregnant, super pregnant, with a little skirt on, short. I we're all waiting around for Redford. He doesn't show up. I'm like, well, that's weird, you know. So the AD comes on. Okay, it's lunch. Everyone go back. You know, it's lunch. I'm walking back to my little cubicle, and I look over, and Redford had a beautiful airstream on on location. I see Florats coming out of his airstream. But here's how dumb I am. I don't, I don't think anything weird. I think, hey, that's kind of cool. Redford took some time out to talk to my wife, you know. Even though he kept us waiting on the set, I'm like, wow, hey, Florence. So you were in there talking with Bob, were you? Huh, what'd you guys talk about? Oh, nothing really, you know, your standard response. <laughs> now I wonder, thinking back. Nine months pregnant in heels? Yeah. That's, I don't know. That's it weird, dude. Me, but it's a bit odd. Well, it's a bit odd. Yeah. yeah. And I know I'll tell you offline. I know the things about Redford, and yeah, he's very, very uh, up there, protected wise. I mean, there's a lot of names that came out with Heidi Fleiss, but yeah, Redford's didn't last long, right? These yeah. guys. And I guess the important thing for any audience watching this, a person that doesn't understand some of the Luciferian stuff, think of it in these terms. These celebrities like Brad Pitt, um, Tom Cruise, they, it's not that they're strong, powerful, or evil even, but they have like a billion dollar business built up around them. You know, imagine Ford Motor Company. Yeah. Someone like me, wandering around homeless yelling about my call girl wife you know and, you know <laughs> wow it's a and i wasn't killed man like it's really kind of amazing yeah most people thought i was nuts so maybe i got like you know maybe that's why i was left alone but yeah these are billion dollar industries tom cruise robert redford brad pitt all of them tom and, hanks yeah and, yep. and, yeah and the machine around them yeah, you got to wonder about Elizabeth Lustig. She had something to tell me. Mm -hmm. What was that, Elizabeth? She was close to Costner and Redford and Brad Pitt. Like, what'd she have to tell me that I didn't know? Yeah. Well, that's disappointing, too, uh, because you, you mentioned the story to me about your friend Bill Paxton. And... You know, yeah. with even the summer, like, I know you and I haven't talked a lot about QAnon, but I've been following it pretty closely. And a lot of people in the community um, have found, like, really crazy, interesting stuff about about Hanks. And, like, he... Uh, yeah. And uh, and you also told me about Isaac Cappy as well, which is also very interesting. Because a lot of people think that, you know, Cappy was, you know, Cappy was suicided because he wouldn't shut his mouth. You know, he was talking about way too much stuff. And um, so... Which could be the case. It could, it could be the case. I mean, the truth is we don't actually know. But there's a lot of weird circumstantial evidence around that. Um, but yeah, tell, tell me about Bill Paxson. Bill was just a guy from Texas. He loved his dad. Him and his dad had a really good bond, you know. There's a lot of fractured people that get to Hollywood. Yeah. They come from not necessarily broken families, but some of them may come from abuse. They, they, they have a need to sort of become famous. Yeah. Because becoming famous didn't used to be a normal thing. Yeah. Now yeah. it's the Kardashian and co. Everybody wants to be friggin' famous, right? Yeah. Yeah. Being famous didn't used to be this big deal. 
Guy could work, have a gas station, have his five kids, go home at night, you know, feel good about himself, man. Watch a sports game. Like, let's go. I'm doing great. But all these people, you know, flocking to Hollywood to be famous. And a lot of these young guys right now, they're all handsome, but they almost all look the same. It's like, I can't make, like, you know, they're all like Hallmark movie guys or something. Like, it's weird. They're not different in any way. They're, they're so similar, you know? But um, the thing with Paxton, so he came from a good family, and he'd come and I hung out. I wasn't his best friend or anything like that, but if ever we saw each other, you know, Bill was like, hey, Shell, and saw you in a movie last night, man. You were crazy, man. You know, that's <laughs> Bill, right? Yeah. <laughs> but Paxton was supposed to do a film with, um, and I, you know, because of a, our mutual friend, I can't say too much here, but... Paxton was supposed to do, um, I think he was working, on, well, I know he was working on a project with Spielberg and Tom Hanks. Yeah. And something went south and Paxton wasn't doing it anymore. Yeah. Uh, my friend doesn't know the, the particulars or certainly won't tell me. But Bill, Bill Paxton went in the hospital for some kind of routine uh, operation. It wasn't a major operation. It's something that you go in you know, it's a burp and then you leave. Like, it wasn't a major thing, I don't think. So Bill goes into Cedar sinai and he dies over this routine operation. And, um, you know, everyone bought it at first. I think even his family did. And then afterwards, um, I was told uh, that his family, the Paxton family, are, are uh, trying to sue or bring a lawsuit against Cedar sinai for, you know, wrongful death or whatever they call that, right? Um, yeah, so, you, it, you know, again, it's these, these, you know, the little question mark, man. It's like, how, is this related to anything? And no, having known Bill, if he was given an ultimatum, like, this is what we do to be in the club, uh, I don't believe Bill would do it. No. But you see, the other thing that most people is everybody can't be in on it in Hollywood because it, it, it just, you can't do it. You got to have key players in on it, and then the other one. So the, the, you know, imagine you're an actor and you just think the world's, you know, the way it looks. Everything's fine out here, and you're kept completely in the dark about any of this really serious, nefarious, evil stuff. Yeah, you, they got to have some of those people. I want to believe that. Um, 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 oh God, now I'm blanking on his name. Um, Denzel Washington, I want to believe he's an okay guy. Yeah. Like, part of me just, I want to believe it. One bit to add to all this is this, will, if anyone's wondering what it was like to be in surveillance all those years ago and harassed constantly, they could get in any lock, anything I had, any apartment, any hotel, motel, anything. Nothing was secure. So what it does to you psychologically is that you can never find safety and you're never believed. So you can't talk about it because you'll just be considered mentally ill. Thank God I was never diagnosed as mentally ill, other than the PTSD. But I went to a movie one day at Marina del Rey, and I was, I think, homeless or living on the side of a Russian uh, priest's house. You know? Anyway, I go to a movie, which I didn't normally do, and I go see Enemy of the State, because it sounds like this could be, and it's an audience mostly of uh, you know, black women. It's just true. It was an audience of mostly black women that I Because everybody wanted to see Will Smith. <clears throat> yeah, maybe. I guess, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So I'm watching the movie. I start, I start crying. And, and you know, the, the women in the audience are looking around like, you know, like, what kind of mess is this guy on? Like, you know, what's he crying for? Because no one would see Enemy in the State and cry. It's not a natural reaction to that film. But the surveillance that Will Smith went through in that, all the surveillance and him not knowing how they find them and all that stuff. And Gene Hackman saying, take off your belt, take off your shoes. You know, don't you see, look at your chip. Yeah, that was my life back then. Yeah. It was the closest film to my life. That's insane, dude. It really is. Anyway, and we were saying earlier, like reality, reality is way more insane than fiction, right? 
It is. It really is. Who could believe it? <clears throat> like, ah, you know. And even the, people, even the even the writers that get accolades nowadays, it's like, you know, oh, these people are so creative and so inventive and whatever. Like, I've heard people rave about Tom Clancy, and I'm like, uh, guys, you, you know, the hunt for Red October is a true story. I mean, Clancy lived around me, and he had friends in the at Langley and friends in the FBI and friends downtown. Like most of these screenplay, most novels he wrote were based on stories that were leaked to him by his friends. Of course, I did a thing with Sean Stone that you saw, and and that was all about like how I'd get rewrites. And I'm like, I'm ready to go. Why the rewrite? Well, we talked to Langley, or we talked to the FBI, and they want to make these adjustments. And I'm like, what do you mean? You, 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 you mean you have to answer to them? Wow, okay, I'll learn this new stuff then. Shit, all right. You know, uh, and that's just very, like, you know, that was only me. So everyone in Hollywood on major films must go through this, where if it's a spy thing, and if they use CIA or any alphabet number, it's basically monitored, watched, and partially written by those agencies. Yeah. And yeah. what you find is they you know, all kinds of truth. Bye, honey. Bye, Kim. Maybe a vodka soda, but no wine for me. <laughs> I'm looking at my face here. I look like I'm 87. Yeah, okay. Get, get, get him some white claws. Some what? White claws. Those, those are vodka sodas. They're pretty good. They're in a can. That's in the U.S. We've got something here called Neutron. Neutron. Okay. Neutron. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I like them, though, you know. I'm doing a keto thing right now, so I have one of those, and I'm like, whoa. You know, oh, 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 oh ooh, I feel great, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, I can't remember. I was talking to Steve, something about the films, and um, um, I, I can't remember. I lost my train of thought. Uh, the, uh, oh, doing the thing with Sharon Stone. And um, that was the, the Golden Fleece, right? That thing? I don't know. It was the interview. He interviewed me, and then I went off on one of my infamous tangents and started talking about Gary DeVore. Oh, okay. You know, I was thinking because I know I, I, you know, um, um, I have a friend that helped Sean make that, uh, that campy uh, martial arts film. I'll, I'll send you a link okay. to it. Yeah. So it's. Because in that film, Sean like kind of pokes fun at all all the conspiracies. I like, to see it. I like Sean's script. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, my my friend yeah. Brian, who I told you, well, is a- is uh, is helping me write the screenplay that I told you about. Uh, he worked with Oliver Stone on on the JFK film. Did you wow. hear that? I didn't. Know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're so writing. I, yeah, I'll tell I'll tell you more about the about the screenplay I'm working on because I want you to help me with it too. I want it to be the best possible. I, I'm I'm gonna make the new uh, the new epic mythos film for the world. It's gonna be the best film ever. I'm putting it out there in the universe right now. It is, you know, with guys like you and, and my buddy Brian helping me. It's gonna be the best movie ever. I'll get in with. What's that? I'll get in with both feet. Awesome, bro. I'll jump in with both feet. <laughs> and I also, you know, if we don't start up with what we're contributing amongst ourselves, then Hollywood's finished, man, I think. It is. Uh, they might have some TV shows. They might do some films. But when a guy can go out like I did with a halfway decent digital camera, and then we can make a film like What the Spark Is, which I do think is a great film. It's an awesome even, film. Like, let, it's you know, really good. Love it. They never... They usually don't always, oh, this is low budget. I don't get, people no. seldom bring that up, even though, yeah, we didn't have, like, you can tell we don't have green screen. There's a lot of stuff we don't have that those kind of films generally have. But as a psychological thriller, I think it works on so many levels, you know? And that wonderful couple of the reviews I've had over the last couple of years, it's like, holy cow, man. I never, ever got reviews like that when I was acting, you know? Yeah. I mean, not that great. And I honestly, I I don't I think he's got a real darkness to him, David Lynch. But I will say his style of filmmaking is is absolutely in my 
in my wheelhouse, as they say, right? I love yeah. it. I love his style. He was making digital films. I think one of his films was all digital. And he was just doing that stuff. He's experimental. The guy's an artist, right? Well, he's, from, from my perspective, he's got a really strong influence from French New Wave in the 60s. Yeah, that's right. You're right. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're already beyond that point. But since, like, I was doing short films in 2004, 2005, since this time frame, we're sort of in that, that, that French New Wave thing yeah. with all the digital stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Because you want to warm it up. Mm -hmm. Because digital can be cool, even the way you're framing and stuff. So you got to be kind of careful and get some heartbeat and warmth uh, into it because it is digital after all. The beauty of 35 mil is that, you know, it looks like uh, portraits from the Renaissance. Well, yeah, it does. It looks like, you know, those 35 millimeter sensors almost almost realistically recreate the 35 millimeter film yeah almost yeah, almost That's right it's, it's very very, very close. close very close but why don't we have to start our own for lack of a better term our own studio or studios right well i've been talking to a lot of people like that like talking to mike pack and brad martin and and i haven't actually talked to mike smith yet who's brad's partner in that in that movie um uh, out of shadows. Oh yeah, okay. And um, there's some other people. I met a girl on uh, on Twitter the other day. Her name is Victoria Gates. She's an actress. She goes by Praying Actress. And um, uh, I met a I met a guy who calls himself Gaffer Anon, okay. and he's and and uh, he's married to what well, his sister is married to a well known Hollywood actor. Uh, and we we had some fun conversations. He's a nice guy. So I'm tr I'm trying to build a community for us. To branch something out and and mike's mike pack has also mentioned to me uh wanting to do set up an interview with me and and antonio sabato jr who i know very little about i know his name i know he's been in like you know uh, soap operas and some films and stuff and i think he was married to a very attractive wealthy woman in hollywood but he's gone public and saying i want to you know let's start a Let's start a conservative, moral-based movie studio. And uh, Mike's also trying to get me in touch with Kaya Jones. And you know, there's a lot of good people that have a lot of skills, either acting, filmmaking, music, behind the scenes, whatever. Dude, uh, Hollywood's irrelevant at this point in a lot of ways. It's not dead yet, but man, it's on the ground rolling around. But there's got to be people in that place that have not been compromised. I mean, I even wonder one night when I was in the film in France if something was done. Because I, I went to have one drink, blacked out for 12 hours, had no memory. And I was with, it was like Rosemary's baby with these rich people pointing at me and their little kids were around me. And it's like, I had one small drink Woke up 12 hours later naked in a bed I'd never slept in before. So if I got compromised, I want to know, though. I'm not like one of these dickheads that's like, well, let's cover it. I don't know. I've never been approached. No one's ever told me anything like that. But if anything happened, I want to know. Well, I think we both know the answer to that already, unfortunately. <laughs> if anyone out in Hollywood that, that was drugged, that was compromised, let's get it out in the open, man. Absolutely. You know, don't don't let people all, hold it over your head. I mean, if if you're drugged and those things are done really? to you against your will, uh, so l let people blackmail you because you it, you didn't do anything wrong. Something a, com a crime was committed against you. Right. I know a guy that gets raped by a Joint Task Force American officer. This guy he was getting the guy's straight and he's married. Okay. This guy was a computer scientist. He was getting raped by this macho guy from the Joint Task Force who was scopolamine. You ever heard of it? Yeah, yeah. It's from plant in Colombia. Yeah. This guy stayed here with us. And we're like anybody else. He tells you all the stuff that he's gone through. He's following me. Even me, even me, I'm kind of reluctant to fully believe you know, that sounds far out, that kind of thing, right? I'm a little reluctant. We'll see. He was here about half a day. Oh, my God, the cars, the people walking by, with see them with their cell phones pointed at our place, you know. I mean, this is all stuff I experienced. Maybe the layperson wouldn't know. Actually, Kim noticed it. 
Jim, Jim noticed it as well. So yeah, obviously there are underworld. But this poor guy would get scopolamine. They can blow it in your face. They've got aerosol cans on it now. And you have no will left. You get yeah. scopolamine. Someone says, okay, we're going to go to your bank. You're going to take all your money out. And you're going to hand it to me. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Crazy stuff, man. I don't know if the whole world is susceptible to scopolamine, but... Like, do you think there are some people that maybe have an immunity to it? It's possible. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to go too far, too far of an elevation here, but yeah, let's take the 40,000 foot view. And I think most rational people can look up at the sky and know the difference between a contrail and a chemtrail, right? Right. Who knows what kind of shit they're spraying on us? I mean, they could be lacing us with, you know, lithium, which, you know, people have already proven that NASA's put rockets out and uh, put lithium powder in, in the atmosphere. And that affects everybody. Barely. You know, they could be hitting us with, you know, SSRIs, antidepressants. They could be hitting us with all kinds of chemicals and stuff. You know what's kind of frightening for me is I've noticed this summer up here in, in Ontario, mm -hmm. we have had less cloud cover, less of these stripes in your sky that then fatten out and destroy a nice, what would have been a nice sunny day, right? Yeah. We've had less of it this summer than ever before. So I'm, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping not, but I'm, I'm, what I imagine is what the case is, is that almost the whole globe now has absorbed these nanoparticles. The aluminum, strontium, barium yeah. stuff. And I had a scientist once tell me who was in on this, because I was yelling about chemtrails 16, 18 years ago, more. Um, what can happen or what does happen or what the plan maybe was is that the stuff gets in your body and then it magnetizes and almost becomes its own little space station inside it. So you don't have to be injected with an RFID chip. You're, you've, you've, already, you've already got one inside of you. From yeah. all the crap you've absorbed. Yeah. I hope it's not the case, but it's a frightening thought if it is. So now they've got us, so they don't even have to spray as much anymore. But how could anyone look up? I agree with you, Chris. How can any rational, halfway smart person um, not notice the difference between a contrail, which dissipates quite quickly, and something else that fattens out into these clouds. Like, I guess it's just cognitive dis dissonance again. Like people just, they'll just refuse to believe it, man. Yeah. They can't believe governments and world powers could be that evil. Yeah. Well, I mean, the army, the army uh, laced the water of a small town in Indiana with LSD. And they did an experiment on that town in the 50s. You know, it was the Army and the CIA did that. I mean, if that was the 1950s, what the hell have they done in the last 50 years, right? It's insane. What they we talked to Hank and what they've done to people like Hank. Now, with Hank, there's a motive because he was with someone like mine. Yeah. Uh, but there's a I mean, your, your stories are almost identical, which is insane. Yeah, they are pretty similar. Yeah. Uh, um, the only thing, well, there's differences, but what Hank gets gets hit with i don't get that yeah so you think well i never got it so it's probably not real oh no i mean again there's i've been in this world for so long now and i've met guys that worked at alphabet agencies developing this technology mm -hmm. and darpa and dr duncan and all these different people i got a really close friend in texas who is a doctor who also has been targeted He's a big guy, 250. He got knocked off his feet one day, had a phony heart attack or whatever it was. Like they mm -hmm. hit him so bad. Yeah. Like directed energy weapons is just an extension of, you know, it's an extension of MK Ultra and that stuff you're talking about, the LSD in the water, you know. Yeah, it, there's a lot of people that are being targeted and they got nowhere to go and no one believes them. And I bet you half of them have probably gone to mental institutions. Especially oh, ones that say they've got voice to skull. Yeah. Vo imagine you've got voices in your head, but you can distinguish that it. it's not yours, and you know it's coming from out there. Well, who's going to believe you? Because it's written in that, what's the Bible for the 
psychiatric code. And there's all kinds uh, of DSM five yeah. or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, we got like five hundred new ones. I don't know, but it's crazy. But yeah, if you hear voices in your head, you're immediately diagnosed as schizophrenic. They, but because they, they're told to do that, the mental health profession never take into account that it could actually be possible. Like there is something to prove that that technology is available, but no, nope, they won't go near it. So yeah, I can't imagine being one of those poor people. And I, I know I've, you know, I've, I've talked to them. I've tried, I've tried to help them. It's like, it's just a terrible, terrible world for someone like that because you know, no one believes you, and you're getting constantly harassed and badgered by a voice attack. And you know, no one's yeah. Yeah, I, I, Hank's, my Hank's life situation. I love to. Get yeah, Hank's situation is definitely extreme. There's no question about. I mean, I'd say he's on the on a scale of one to ten. He's at a ten, definitely. So the and the yeah the people that he doesn't that get voice to, to oh, I don't think. yeah. Um, so we've got people looking in this situation and like I mentioned before, that this is, this is a big giant ass hornet's nest. So it has, we have to approach it very delicately yeah. to help him. Cause you know, we're dealing with bad people. We're dealing with killers. We're dealing with heartless, soulless androids. Like you call them in the, in your monologue. They're not human. They can't be. I can't. Be. No. They can't be. And that's why the average person can't believe a lot of this stuff because it just doesn't seem possible. No. You can't imagine that people could be that evil, that terrible. Like it's, they can't be human, man. I don't know what they are. Like, I'm sorry to say, even my ex wife, I try to have empathy for her and I try to, in my own way, forgive something that I still don't know what I'm forgiving. But her coldness and her lying and, and everything she did. It's like, I want to, I want to have empathy for her, but it's like, there was no one, there was no one there. Yeah. There, and she even admitted things like that. to me. Well, if there's a way like, to, plastic. if there's a way to destroy or, or completely decimate whatever makes a human soul or spirit, whatever it is that makes us, you know, you can have that connection with, with the spirit realm, right? If They've probably found out a way to destroy it completely. I mean, that's the only way I can imagine that people, because the people we're talking about are absolute psychopaths. No empathy, no nothing. They're just horrible monsters. No, they get off on pain. Inducing pain, causing our torment, they get off on it. There's probably a whole bunch of them right now. <clears throat> they see people driving around in their cars with their masks on. <laughs> Laughing their asses they've off. Created, and they, they get off on it. Yeah. You know? They're having like many orgasms over it. Like they just absolutely love it. Florence's humor was like an old man crossing the street gets hit and killed. Stuff like that was hilarious to her. Like she, <laughs> she relished stuff. You know? And I'm like, how's that funny? The guy's dead. You know, he's 85 years old, man. Well, it could have been your granddad. What's wrong with you? Uh, oh, crap. I guess a little part of me is broken because some, right. there, there's some things that I laugh about. Like, you know, I've seen these videos of like the Antifa protesters. I think there was something that happened in Kentucky last night. This person was in his truck and you could see the person was clearly panicked. And you know, telling them, just get out of the way, get out of the way. And they're swarming around the guy's truck and he just plows someone over and then leaves the scene. And I put myself in the position of that, of the truck driver and thinking, these people are stupid. What do they think they're going to do? Block a truck, you know? So when I see an idiot get run over, I'm kind of like, <laughs> so, maybe I'm a little bit broken. <laughs> It's a little bit different, but yeah, I, I know it's insane. I, I, I told you, I think, no, I think 50%, about 50% of these um, Antifa brats, I think they're SRA victims. Yeah. There's a guy called, there's a guy called uh, Russ Dizdar. Yes. And he, 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 
Okay, so you know, you, I'm glad you know of them. Well, yeah. Dizdar says the numbers are huge in America, like 8 million yeah. um, people have, have, have like dissociative identity disorder, have been programmed, have no idea they've got alters. But when I see the Antifa stuff, I'm like, wow, they have to be SRA victims, man. And again, part of you wants to feel sorry for them because they're literally out of their mind. Like, they have no idea even why they're doing it, some of this stuff. So, yeah, that answers the question of why these kids want to climb up on top of a car as it's trying to leave and they're bashing in the guy's windows. They're out of their minds. Yeah, they are out of their minds. They're just out of their minds. Well, my, my friend Brian sent me an article earlier today. And I, I read this and I, I, I just shook my head. I'm like, okay, we've officially entered, in, entered full batshit mode in the world around us right now. It's, it's in the Huffington Post. And it says, um, let's see, try to turn my phone back on. Okay, come on, come on, come on. Okay. The death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg pushed me to join the Satanic Temple. I'm a 40-something attorney and mother who lives in a quiet neighborhood with a yard and a garage full of scooters and soccer balls. I am not the type of person who would normally consider becoming a Satanist, but these are not normal times. Hail Satan. <laughs> like, can you believe that? That is absolute insanity. It tells you we've literally entered the mode where people are calling good evil and evil good. Things are inverted. Oh, 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 that's fine. Oh, oh, please, God, don't let this be a trend. Oh, unreal. You know, when you're telling me stuff and everything, and I guess we refer to ourselves as uh, conservative, which for me to hear that I'm a conservative, I gotta find a better word for it than that because a moral person. You know, look at you're just a you're, you're a moral, moral person. person. Yes. Yeah, you don't have to be a Christian to have morals. You can be an atheist and have morals. It's a sense of right and wrong. And this inverted world that we're living in. I don't know. You know, what's liberal about it? There's nothing liberal to me in it. Like you well, know, I don't know. Just, their idea of liberalism is you know? is fully unrestrained evil. That's what I that's what I see. Because, you know, this Marxism... How many babies do you think Ruth Ginsburg is responsible for basically their deaths with their abortion? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, you know, I have my opinion about that as well, that it's just sacrifice. It's sacrifice to evil. Absolutely. It is. It's a sacrifice. It's also stealing the organs while they're fresh. And, uh, but yeah, sacrifice is right up there. I don't know. It's just, imagine you've got doctors and nurses that see they're doing their job, they'll say. And it's like, well, no, you were allowing this. You were doing this in the setting of a hospital where people trusted you and you were basically killing babies. Like, yeah. you know, unbelievable. I just, well, I've got to pay the rent. I got to make the house payment. You know, I gotta. I guess that's how they justify it. I don't know. I don't have the solution. I just, you know, people should have walked away. A lot of doctors that are speaking out are getting, they're getting targeted, man. They're yeah. getting cars following them. They're getting their stuff. That. I guess I lost you. Uh, we're back now. We're okay. We're good now. I I'm, I'm gonna have some dinner maybe. What time is it? Oh, it's early stuff. Anyway, we're probably okay for now, right? Yeah, man. Yeah. Do you have any other questions you need to ask? Me? No, dude. We can we can pick up a part two. I think there's still a lot of cool stuff you can share with us. Um, and I definitely, um, yeah. I definitely want to talk more about your artwork. I think that's a cool part of your story. And um, I'm gonna. Uh, I guess I'll post a link to the. You said that was the version that was shared for the uh, the festival viewing. for yeah uh, yeah for spark you, yeah yeah you, i gave you that didn't i yeah 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 you sent me that link um 
Yeah, and another that's question. Free for anyone that's okay, and another question I have is, um, how many film festivals did you submit that to? I'm just like really curious. Okay, the sad thing about I think about about eight or nine, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. The bad thing about festivals is that they all require money. You have to pay to submit it. Yeah. And I found out the hard way that a lot of these festivals, they take their friends or they take films that are endorsed and have a budget and stuff. They'll take those because it's smart business. Yeah. Like you're independent making a film, even though it's like great, they, sh they, 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 don't, they don't put your film in the festival. Oh, well, we're going to have to make some new film festival systems as well in our new yeah, uh, our new film yeah. industry. And I, one festival I'd love to do, actually, I could have, uh, I'd love to, you know, okay, I'd love to do a festival, and they, they do exist, they do exist, but I want to do my own version of it. Um, I want to do a festival in a drive-in movie theater. That's a great idea. That's a really, yeah. really good idea. I, yeah, and you know what? You know what are a lot of fun to watch when you see a batch of them? Some can be bad. It doesn't matter. I mean, hopefully most of the batches is, is good, interesting. Uh, uh, um, like I was in a lot of short film festivals in Montreal. I went to the number one festival in the world for a short film, and they loved this film I made for 55 bucks, and they took it all over the world, right? Yeah. I didn't get one duck from Canada, ten telefilm, but Telefilm tried to take credit for my film, of course. You know, they didn't give me a nickel. Most of the short film festivals I've been, I've been in, I'm the only one that hasn't received government funding. But when you do a batch of short films together, yeah, they are so great, man. And it doesn't wear you out to watch. I, I shouldn't concentrate on the negative, but like, let's say the worst thing you have to stuff with you is 10 minutes of something that's not that great, but really creative. Yeah. And then the rest are really compelling, you know, 15, 20 minute short films. Wow. Yeah. And, it, and you, get, you get you get so much stuff. And to be at a drive-in movie theater, you know, yeah. like no social distancing. I'm in my car, asshole. You know, <laughs> like I just, uh, yeah. You yeah. Have to bring a little bowl of weed or whatever, you know what I mean? Just sit there <laughs> in your vehicle and have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's a super good idea. Yeah, I'll, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick your brain. I'll, I'll send you, uh, I've got a character bio and a short uh, outline for uh, a school project. Okay. And I've got the first scene written. I'd love to get your feedback on it. I want to, you know, I want to blow smoke up my professor's ass and make sure I get a really good grade. So you can look at it and say, oh, Chris, this is garbage. Okay. <laughs> you, you, need to, you need to fix this. So How many pages is it written? Oh, uh, right now it's just. No, I just no, got, I, I probably wouldn't. How many? Pages? Uh, right now I've just got the first two pages of dialogue. I imagine it's not going to be more than ten pages, total. Okay. Yeah, I mean it's it's okay, like so it's going to be a, a, a five right? to seven minute short. It's it's super super short. So, but yeah, I just I just love your your professional oh, sage wisdom and advice. Have, yeah. Do you have final draft? <laughs> uh, no, I don't anymore. I, I used to though, and it's good to use. Yeah, well, they've got a collaboration yeah, feature now. Down yeah, so if you got the collaboration feature, you know, we can actually. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, I said even our shitty computers can probably download that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. The final cut. Hell, at this point, I'll buy you a license, man, because you're going to be helping me a lot. I'm going to be paying you big money. Our movie is going to be incredible. What? <laughs> yeah. You know what my expert, I have some, some area of expertise in film writing. Um, the woman I had my first kid was an Obie Award-winning theater um, right, a playwright. Um, she stole from me. So that was kind of a compliment looking back at me when I was 26, 27, because I honestly thought I was just kind of uh, broken, you know, like a, I don't know, a blackboard with just a few, you know, bit of ch chalk marks on it. And what she gave me, aside from all the <laughs> aggravation and stuff, she was black and Japanese, by the way. But yeah. what she gave me is she gave me belief in what I could do. She, she ended up just letting me write like 
80% of the screenplay we wrote together. Because I'm really good with dialogue. Because yeah. I always write dialogue like people talk. And there's just simple things like to, to try not to um, stand there and, and, and what's the word? Exposition. Stay away from exposition. Stay away from a person standing there announcing or talking about themselves. Just discover all that stuff for the guy, by the guy, maybe go to a grocery store and his neighbor's in the store. Hey, what's up, Bob? Well, oh, not much, bro. Yeah, you know, and, and then, you know, just so easy for me. Like, I just, I'm, I'm surprised more people can't write dialogue. I don't know why um, dialogue seems to be such a stickler. They used to give me cash once in a while in LA to work on, you know, like studio projects. And they don't, I don't they only want me for like three pages. And I'm like, shit, yeah, you know. Send it over. I'll do it. You know. It's a shame you didn't get more credit, dude. I mean, I, I it's funny because my friend yeah, Brian, who, who I'll, I'm going to introduce you to Brian. You guys will hit it off marvelous. Brian was telling me about a meeting he had with a studio head, and uh, uh, let's just say a very, very well-known actor was there, an A-lister, and they were talking to Brian about his script, and. Uh, one of the producers was kind of shit talking. He's like, ah, you know, fuck the writers. And someone chimes in and is like, well, if it wasn't for the writers, we wouldn't have any films. But what this guy, the studio head didn't know is that Brian was sitting right there and they were looking at his script and they were shit talking writers. And I can tell you right now, Brian is a fucking genius. Like he's, he's, wow. a, he's a masterpiece writer. He's like, ah, wow. you know, pay them shit and make money on all their hard work. This is what one of the studio heads was saying. And so Brian kind of chops this guy to pieces and, and Clooney starts laughing. Oh, I didn't mean to say it. Well, anyway, I said it. Clooney starts laughing his ass off because, because my buddy Brian just decimated these studio guys, uh, you know, with their mentality. Well, like you've got <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But is that a surprise? Is that a surprise? Don't have any. Yeah. Well, they just think they can. Not at all. No. Think about green who've been ripped up left, right, and center. Yeah. You know, I mean, I know, I know, at least twenty people that have been ripped off for their intellectual property. So you can only imagine, and then you find out it's so, it's so, there's so much of it going on, or was going on. Yeah. You know, screenwriting, music, all this stuff. It's Insane. If you don't yeah. have a powerful lawyer agency, you're done. Yeah. I tell screenwriters, get your lawyer in first. Get yourself good with a big entertainment lawyer. You know, I yeah. say it's the best way. You got to protect yourself. Otherwise, I had a series stolen from me, and it was the one of the largest hits in Canadian history. It was a Canadian U.S. production. Yeah. Oh, Rose, you know, Roseanne, Roseanne told me the same thing. Roseanne told me myself. Sorry, it happened right, again. All right, man. All right, we'll call it a day. Great it's talking fun. with you. Absolutely, man. Yeah. And uh, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, let... what's that? No, I was just gonna say, let me know about the stuff that you're working on, and send that through as soon as you can. I'd love to have a look and fiddle around, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna make suggestions. That's what I always like to do. Yeah, dude. No, I, I, I want to, I want to learn from the pro, dude. I, that's what I loved about your film, is I thought the dialogue was incredible, the pacing, you know, the action writing, all that kind of stuff. Because I, that's, that's what I want to learn. Because I want to make sure I write a good film. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'll just say it. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just learning how to do this. So, um, I absolutely, absolutely want to learn. Maybe that's too. That could be to your advantage in that you don't know the playbook exactly. Yeah. So you can bring something to the table that's completely original. Yeah. It could feel like a screw up, but it's not because it's just who you are. It's like, what did I do? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like that about my art. I've had some major, major shows, even museum shows. So I never went to art school. I was a homeless guy that everyone thought was nuts. What other kind of profession could I have done back in LA in 79, 80, what is it? Yeah, 97. Yeah, I thought to myself, what job, what profession? You know, I can be completely out of my mind and I'm an artist. Yeah. There you and go. That's what, that's what gave birth to the art. And see these. And rich, I love art, but. 
Yeah, the rich oh, deletes yeah. get off on that, right? You know, they're like, oh, he's so eccentric. <laughs> <laughs> we would pay him lots of uh, money for his crazy art. On the yeah. and, and the art world and how they've just taken a great big pile on it. Like, yeah. they have just decimated and desecrated on the art world. Like, the worst kind of crap you can imagine is sitting in museums. Like, it's really, they really intentionally tried to destroy that. Well, you know, I think we should start, start calling them. And they're, oh, no. Yeah, we should start calling them the deletes. Good. I've been using it for a while. I love it. There's nothing I, yeah, I heard that from you then. That's what I was like. I was like, where did this? I just heard that, and that's you. That, we give credit where credit is due, because when I heard that, I was like, oh, that's awesome, yeah. Um, Stephen Shellen, we call them the deletes. <laughs> yes, I love it, man. All right. All right, brother, okay, I'll talk so to we'll you soon. Talk to yep, sounds All good, right. man. See you, Brian All right. and Mike. Bye. All right, bye.